Hi there, esteemed audience, and welcome to another episode of Little Great Ninja. I'm your host, Rob Kent, as you know, author of Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees and Banneker Bones and the Alligator People, to be followed up by an as-of-yet-to-be-revealed uh, untitled third Banneker Bones adventure. Uh, if you like middle grade action, nonstop action in the style of, say, oh, I don't know, Mission Unstoppable by Dan Gutman, you might enjoy Banneker Bones. If you prefer to have a little bit of humor in there, like, say, oh, I don't know, My Weird School by Dan Gutman, you might enjoy Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees. Uh, and the good news is you can get that as a paperback, an audiobook, or the ebook is free to download whenever you're watching or listening to this, wherever fine ebooks are sold. So check out Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees. When you enjoy it, come back and see me for the sequels and bring money. Uh, under the super secret pen name Robert Kent, I've written some horror stories for older readers, such as All Together Now, a zombie story, which is a young adult novel uh, in the style of The Walking Dead. So if you like your zombies slow and rotting, uh, if you like your humans in despair and constant crisis and a lot of violence, well, All Together Now, a zombie story is the book for you. If you prefer an even more adult horror novel, you can check out my five-volume uh, serial horror novel, The Book of David. Uh, that one's about an atheist who buys a haunted house that then begins to give him religious visions involving flying saucers. So right, a no, right away, you know from that description whether that's something that interests you or not. Uh, if you're curious, it's five, uh, I call them chapters, but the fifth chapter is the longest book I've yet written. There are five chapters, five books, and The Book of David uh, telling a single tale. If you're curious, you can check out The Book of David, Chapter 1 by Robert Kent. Uh, it's an e-book that's free to download whenever you're watching or listening to this, wherever fine e-books are sold. Uh, as always, keep up with what's coming up on the show, who's going to be here on the podcast at middlegradeninja.com. Uh, our next episode will be later this week with author Thomas Taylor. Uh, I'm very excited to chat with him. Uh, and then we've got several uh, literary agents and uh, other publishing professionals coming, as well as uh, more of my favorite authors, such as Annie Sullivan, John Claude Bemis, more folks than uh, I have time to uh, name here. Just go ahead and do yourself a favor and subscribe, either if you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe to the channel. If you're listening to this on a podcast app, hit subscribe. It's free. It helps the algorithms. It boosts, all, it boosts the show. It helps me out. And don't you want to know what's going on? Who's going to be here next? Hit subscribe to get a notification as soon as there's a new show. Uh, today, I am talking with none other than the man, the myth, the legend, author, Dan Gutman. Dan, how are you this morning? Good, Rob. How are you? I am absolutely thrilled to be chatting with you. Uh, I have been following your work for many years, uh, and I feel like I've, I've uh, gotten a sense of you online. This is the first time you and I are ever talking face-to-face, -face. so I am thrilled about all the uh, things we're going to discuss today. Um, to start, why don't uh, I, I'm bad at summarizing other people's books and other people's biographies. Uh, so since I've got you right here, uh, if you would give a steamed audience kind of an overview of your career thus far and where you're at so that those who haven't been religiously stalking you online uh, will, will have a sense of uh, the, the man, the myth, the legend that we're about to speak with. Very quick bio you want? Absolutely. All right. OK, well, I'll let you like. Okay, I'll try and keep it brief because I don't want to bore anybody, but uh, I was born on October 19th, 1955 in New York City. Uh, very quickly, my family moved to New Jersey, Newark, New Jersey, beautiful Newark, New Jersey, uh, where I grew up. And uh, I graduated from Rutgers University in 1977 with a degree in psychology. Never took any writing classes in college. Uh, even went to graduate school for psychology for a couple of years. And then I decided that uh, I was going to move to New York City and become a starving writer, which is where all the starving writers go. So I did that for about uh, uh, 15 years, trying to write for adults unsuccessfully. And then I became a children's book writer and was unsuccessful at that for a long time, too. <laughs> but uh, gradually things started to fall into place. And I've been doing this for a long time now. I'm 63 now. And uh, I'm sure you're going to get into details about my various books, so I won't get into too much of that. But uh, I write mainly for, I would say, reluctant readers because that's what I was when I was a kid. I didn't like to read. So I think I, I relate really well to kids who are like that. How's that, Rob? That's perfect. Uh, <laughs> lots, uh, lots to unpack a little bit. Let's start with uh, your journey from reluctant reader to 
uh, extremely prolific author. Obviously, you, you've overcome that. When did uh, that turn around and you when did you discover that books were something you enjoyed? I think it was about uh, fourth grade or so. Uh, I didn't like to read. My mother was really worried about me. You know, she used to buy me comic books and mad magazines, hoping it would get me interested in reading. Didn't really work. And it wasn't until I was in about fourth grade when I became a big sports fan, especially baseball. Um, and I, I suddenly I wanted to know everything about sports. And back then there was no Internet. You know, if you want to learn about something, you had to read, read about it. So I started reading uh, books about my favorite athletes, started reading the sports section of the newspaper. And that's what got me into into reading. Um, and uh, to this day, I would say if something doesn't really grab me on the first few pages, I just lose interest and close the book. So I, I'm to a certain extent, I'm still a reluctant reader today. Makes sense. So how what, what what grabs you when you when you pick up a book and how do you try to grab reluctant readers such as yourself uh, now? Yeah, well, you, you know how some authors will, will spend like, you know, page after page describing what the weather looks like or what a house looks like or what somebody's face looks like. And as a reluctant reader, and I know a lot of kids, especially boys, are reluctant readers, they don't care about any of that stuff. It's boring and they forget it anyway. So I try and cut to the chase, get to the action. Uh, hopefully in the first sentence of the book, I will hook the reader and make them want to know what happens next. And at the end of the first chapter, I will hook them in a way that hopefully they want to turn the page and read the next chapter. And, and if you constantly um, have the reader wanting more, they will keep turning the pages and you can turn a reluctant reader into an enthusiastic reader. And um, I noticed that uh, with the My Weird School books, you never end a chapter without some sort of a cliffhanger, something to keep them coming back. It was uh, one that just so amused me. I wanted to make sure that I shared it here. Uh, let me see if I could quickly find it. It was uh, when they're coming in here to find uh, Miss Laney is Zany. Yeah. Uh, and here's what we saw in there, in there being the girls' restroom. I'm not going to tell you. Okay, okay, I'll tell you, but you have. Yeah. And then, by golly, next chapter, you're going to find out. <laughs> so what makes a good... Uh, what, what kind of things do you do along the way to keep those readers, so keep them from turning on the video game or whatever else that's competing for their attention? Yeah. By, by the way, Rob, I'm, uh, I lost a little bit of your audio on that. Uh, it got a little scratchy. I don't know what happened, but I, I think I got... Can you just say something now? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, everything's good now. Okay. Good. Yeah. Uh, what do I do to hook them? Uh, well, just like you said, it's a cliffhanger. You know, you got to end. I try and, you know, I try and make each sentence flow into the next sentence. Like sometimes when I'm reading a book that's confusing to me, I have to read a sentence over and over again to really understand it or a paragraph. And that turns off a lot of people. So I, I have to make each sentence flow directly into the next one. Each paragraph flow into the next paragraph, each chapter flow into the next chapter so that it's my goal is for the kid to pick up a book and like become so captivated that two hours later, he or she looks up and says like, wow, that didn't even feel like I was reading. I felt like I was watching a movie in my head. You know, that's what I'm trying to accomplish in my books. And you do that by by ending each chapter in a way that almost forces the kid to read the next chapter. I definitely want to unpack that quite a bit because I've got lots of questions for you about my weird school and, and the way those are constructed. Yeah. Um, first, I'd like to ask you just a few more questions about your background. So, you know, the esteemed audience gets to know the real Dan Gutman, uh, whatever that means. Um, <laughs> but during that uh, 15 years when you were working on you know, newspaper articles, screenplays, uh, books for adults, anything else, what kind of stuff were you writing and why do you think it wasn't working? And also, what did that teach you about writing? Yeah, uh, part of it was that my topic was uh, computers. Uh, I, I got my start. I, I used to edit a magazine about video games. This is uh, back in the Pac-Man days, back in the early 80s. And so when I was editing the magazine, I, you know, you, you kind of when you're working on a magazine about a particular topic, people view you as an expert in that particular field. 
even though I really wasn't an expert in video games or computers. So when the magazine went out of business and I started writing on my own, I was an expert in video games and computers. So that was my natural uh, 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 source of, of income. I was going to magazines and publishers that were interested in that particular topic. The problem is I didn't know anything about video games and computers. And I was kind of really, I was an imposter. I was a fraud. And I was trying to write newspaper articles and magazine articles and books and all. But I didn't know what I was talking about. And I wasn't authentic. And so I think that's why I was not successful in that field. And it wasn't until I switched and started writing about sports and started writing about things that interested me that I got better at my craft and uh, people viewed me as somebody who was a good writer. So I just got rejected a million times when I was trying to write about topics that didn't really interest me. So I guess the lesson is that, you know, you should really follow your your natural bent and whatever really fascinates you, that's what you should write about. So when did the light go off that, hey, I should try writing for children? What brought you to that? Uh, well, two things. I mean, first of all, of course, the things I was doing for adults were just not successful and I was not earning a living. And um, that's a good motivation to try something different. Uh, but the bigger thing was my son was born. Uh, my son, Sam, he was born in 1990. And, you know, when you have a young kid, you start reading with them. And I started reading children's books with my son for the first time since I was a kid. And I, I'll, I'll show you a picture of my son, by the way. <laughs> I'll show you a picture of my family, actually. Uh, that's uh, my son, Sam. He's now 29 years old on one side. And uh, my daughter, Emma, on the other side, she's 24 years old, and my wife, Nina, in the middle. And uh, so I started reading with Sam and thinking like, gee, you know, nothing else is working for me. Maybe I should try writing for kids. And as soon as I started writing for kids, Rob, I felt like this is what I'm good at. You know, this is what I should have been doing all along. So then I switched to writing for kids, and I, I've been doing it ever since 1995-ish, I'd say. So what was the what was the difference? Was it easier for you to write or just more satisfying? How did you know that this was the one? Um, all those things. Uh, I related better to the audience. Um, I kind of have the brain of an eight year old myself, I think. <laughs> so I I just naturally uh, um, feel comfortable. Like if I'm um, in, in a group of people, say uh, a cocktail party situation, I'm completely uncomfortable, I notice, you know, but if I'm sitting around at a table at a school with uh, 10, 10 year olds or 11 year olds, I feel completely natural and, and completely at home. And the conversation feels very uh, easy and honest, whereas uh, I'm completely self-conscious, I find, when I'm in a situation with grownups. So I just I just relate well to kids, not in a Michael Jackson kind of way, but, you know. <laughs> No, uh, no, it makes uh, sense. I sometimes wish I was uh, chatting with children when I find myself in a in a group of all adults, especially if it's if I mean if it's a writers conference and I'm chatting with my tribe. That's different. I love talking to writers, but like uh, my wife's in the uh, tech sector, and so we'll go to this uh, big event every year. It's it's called the Mira Awards, and it's a bunch of folks in tuxedos. It's it's nerd Oscars, and they give each other trophies for um, different computer innovations. Mm -hmm. uh, and I found that the, the fastest way to discourage people I don't want to talk to to talk to me is when they ask me, what do you do? I just say, all right, for children. I say, okay, well, it's nice meeting you. All right, bye. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody's networking and everybody is putting on that smile and they're all talking about how you have to work out to keep yourself in shape when you're spending so much time on this and also make sure there's time for uh, charitable donations and make sure that you're giving back to the community and blah, blah, blah. And that's why I'm a great person. And yeah. you look at him like, I bet you spent last weekend with Netflix, didn't you? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I like I feel completely comfortable talking before a group of 200, 300 kids at a time. But if I had to speak to the same number of grownups, I'd get really nervous and upset, uh, uptight, I should say. And I think a lot of children's book authors feel the same way. Yeah, I think a lot of writers are at least partially introverted to begin with. Um, and so I, I know for me, if I'm doing anything terribly extroverted, I'm going to have to spend whatever the amount of time was that I that I did the extrovert time 
uh, I need the exact same amount of time alone to recuperate and, and feel like me again. Sure. Me too. Absolutely. Well, I know that when we had uh, talked uh, back in, what, 2011, um, some of you, I mean, I ask everybody, what are your three favorite books, which I acknowledge is an impossible question. And it, it's a silly one anyway, because you, you, why would you pick just three books when there's an entire library full? Uh, but I know at the time, uh, your favorites were The Invention of Hugo Cabaret, uh, Cat's Cradle by Vonnegut, and uh, Ball Four by Jim uh, Bowden. Um, is that still an accurate uh, summary of your favorite books? Are there any authors you'd like to, to add to that? Oh, uh, well, there's a lot of authors I really admire. Uh, you mentioned Brian Selznick's uh, The Invention of Hugo Cabret, great. Uh, I mentioned Jim Bowden, who just passed away very recently. He was, a, he was not even a writer. He was a pitcher for the Yankees. And uh, he wrote that wonderful book, Ball Four, which was an expose of uh, Major League Baseball back in like 1970 or something like that when I was a teenager. Teenager? Yeah, teenager. And uh, that's I, it was the first time I felt like I was reading uh, a book where the author was not trying to like write beautiful sentences and and paint word pictures. He was just talking to me like we were having a conversation. And I thought, wow, you know, that's what I'm going to try and do in my writing. Just have a conversation with the reader. So that really spoke to me. Um, who else do I like? I like people like uh, Gordon Corman uh, is a children's book author, very popular. David Lubar, friend of mine, he's really good. Um, I guess I like people who write in my style, I must admit. Um, I personally am not really big into fantasy myself. You know, I tried to read the Harry Potter books. Whoosh, they went right over my head, didn't get them. You know, uh, I'm more interested in like uh, book stories about kids like who are uh, ordinary kids who are in an extraordinary situation. You know, I guess that's that's sort of what ties all my books together, too. Uh, ordinary kids in extraordinary situations. So that I think a regular kid out there can sort of fantasize that they're in that situation, too. And those are the kinds of books I like to read, kinds of books I like to write. But to be honest with you, Rob, I'm not really very well read. Um, if I can get through the New York Times every day, I feel like I've accomplished something. And most of my pleasure reading is really research for my own book books because that's what takes up all my time uh reading stuff for my future projects so i i i haven't read uh i don't read a lot just for the fun of it sadly if i'm honest one of the main well, there's a lot of motivations for uh, why i've run the blog for as many years as i have and why i'm not doing this podcast uh, mm -hmm. but chief among them uh, is because I've always got to be reading somebody's book to be chatting with them or doing something else. And I'll read uh, books by adults for uh, for fun and uh, for pleasure. And I'm a big fan of audiobooks. If I'm if I'm not listening to a wonderful podcast such as this, I like to keep an audiobook going because there's just so many hours in the day where you know you're you're mowing the lawn, you're you're doing whatever you are around the house. Um, but um, as far as middle grade books. Um, you know, I'll hit a streak where I'll read like five in a row that just don't do it for me uh, for whatever reason. And if I don't have that motivation of the blog to go ahead and try again, give somebody else a shot, then I'll kind of drift away from it and say, OK, well, what's on Netflix? Let me binge watch something. Um, yeah. Whereas having uh, another uh, guest coming along or somebody else at the blog is always going to keep me current. And then when I meet these people at, at conferences and other events, I can honestly look them in the eye and say, I really enjoyed your book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I, I recently uh, finished a book about Harry Houdini. Uh, and so I spent like the last year just reading every biography of Houdini. And so that's taken up all my time. But it was really, uh, really pleasurable, too. You know, it's fun to uh, read about, uh, write about something that you really are interested in yourself. Do you go to uh, Jack? My wife makes fun of me because I've gone through, she calls them my, my phases, uh, where I become very obsessed about one particular topic and want to know everything there is to know about it for a period. And then I, I feel like I've exhausted that and then I move on to the next thing. Does that mm -hmm. happen with you as well? Uh, there are some topics that are really interesting to me. Like I'm, I'm interested in like technology and inventions and inventors. Uh, but I would say it's more like a, a lifelong thing rather than, you know, going on a jag of one particular thing. So, you know, sports and technology and music and movies, 
But these are the things that interest me and, and always have, I guess. Did you ever come back around on video games or is that still just not something that you're really interested in? You know, it's funny. I, like I spent uh, like three years uh, from like 1980 through 1983 or, or four uh, working on that video games magazine. And, and when it folded, I hardly ever played video games after that. Uh, when my kids were young, we had a PlayStation uh, we had a couple other video game systems. I hardly ever played them. And my kids weren't really that into it either. So I guess it was really just something I did professionally, but was not really personally that interested in them. Oh, you're better off. They'll, they'll ruin your life. <laughs> <laughs> they really <laughs> suck up uh, time, I'll say that much. <laughs> <clears throat> Let's uh, talk a little bit about your, your writing habits, and then I want to do a, a deep dive on my weird school because I would just be a fool to have the Dan Gutman here in front of me and not ask you every question I could think of about my weird school. It but is let's talk my, a little bit. It's um, my bread and butter, my weird school. This is Borders Out of Order, and the new one we should mention is uh, Dr. Floss is the boss, which is going to come out here hit October 15th. That's correct, yes. Uh, actually, I was, I was visiting a school uh, about a year ago, and, you know, I, I always have lunch with a group of kids. So I was sitting around the table and I, I always say to the kids, what's the weirdest thing that ever happened in your school? And somebody said, well, uh, last week the de a dentist was here. And I said, like, what? stop, what? A dentist was at your school? And they said, yeah, every year the dentist comes and teaches them about dental hygiene. And I thought, like, that's a my weird school book waiting to happen. So uh, that's why I wrote Dr. Floss is the Boss, and, uh, and it'll come out in October, as you said. So I, oh, by the way, I dedicated the book to uh, the kids at that school that um, inspired it. I had a dentist that came to our school every year. Really? Uh, and um, <laughs> it, was, it was a good, good, good deal for me to hand out cards, and we'd take them home and give them to mom and dad and say, here, we got to get our teeth cleaned. The, the man that came and gave the presentation on oral hygiene was very insistent, and he's close near the school. We can go see him, and it kept him in business, and he was like the Santa Claus of uh, dentists. And then as a high schooler, I, was, uh, I had a job delivering pizzas on the weekends, uh, and I, I showed up at his house, and he was throwing a party, and he was uh, heavily intoxicated. Uh, and just an absolute jerk, and he just shattered it for me forever. I'm like, no, you were the nice Santa Claus of Dennis. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> he was smart at marketing, I'll say that much. Oh, yeah, he was. He was the probably the most successful dentist in town. Absolutely. Um, he, was, he was out there on his hustle. Well, let's, uh, you know, we're talking about my weird school. Let's get to it. So I could try to summarize what the series is about with you sitting right there able to do it, but what a waste of everyone's time. Why don't you tell us what my weird school is all about? Sure. Uh, well, it all started. I, I used to write just for older kids for like fourth, fifth, sixth grade and up, you know, and I never thought of myself as somebody who would write for for younger audiences. But my daughter, Emma, was in second grade uh, back in 2003, I guess. And she was reading Junie B. Jones, which was hugely popular, you know, and I thought we both thought really that there should be something like Junie B. Jones told by a boy. So I sort of took a Jimmy B. Jones book and sort of reverse engineered it. You know, like I counted the number of words on each page, the number of words in the book, the number of chapters, the number of pictures, stuff like that, the number of lines on the page. And I sort of created my own version of Junie B. Jones, but told from a boy's point of view. And uh, that's how my weird school started. Uh, it wasn't a series to start. You know, I was never so presumptuous to think that it was going to be a series. I just sold the first book, Miss Daisy is Crazy, to HarperCollins, the publisher, and they liked it. Uh, and they asked me for four more. And then they asked me for four more. And then they asked me for four more. And now we're up to um, 59 books altogether. <laughs> and, and each of them have a rhyming title, Miss Daisy is Crazy, Mr. Klutz is Nuts, Miss Porter is Out of Order. And I guess the whole thing that ties the series together is that each book focuses on a different grown-up at the school. And while the kids are all relatively normal, the grown-ups are all a little bit crazy in one way or another. And I think kids relate to that because, uh, you know, they love to read about grown-ups doing dumb things. <laughs> so that's what My Weird School is all about. And uh, uh, amazingly, it became by far the most successful thing I've ever done. And uh, 
I will keep writing it until they pull the laptop out of my cold, dead hands. <laughs> well, 59 books, does that include the, um, uh, the, the spinoff special books and the, no. uh, the My Weird School I Can Read books? No, it doesn't. No, that's just 59 of the regular series. There's also the, um, there's some specials like Bummer in the Summer. There's like six or seven of those. There's the Fast Fact series, uh, which is uh, sort of uh, AJ and Andrea, the main characters, arguing about things like uh, geography and history and science and stuff like that. Um, and also, <laughs> my weird uh, reading tips and my weird writing tips. So uh, altogether, it's like over 70 books. And um, it's just, I'm, I really pinch myself every day because so many authors would give anything to have a successful series. And I, I, I'm, I'm really fortunate that, that that series did become successful. Well, fortunate and, a, and an extremely uh, hard worker. You don't write that many books without uh, a little perspiration. <laughs> I do work really hard. I do. And that's uh, also important. You know, I'm a workaholic. I always have been. And I think if you want to be successful in this thing, unless, unless you, you're like an overnight sensation, you know, uh, which very few of us are, you have to really work hard, and, and I have. Overnight sensation, if that's your strategy, you might as well, why are you writing? Buy lottery tickets, right? <laughs> right, exactly. There's very few of us that, like, our first book comes out, and it's a huge success, you know, or that the first thing we write is published at all. So most of us, I, you know, you had asked me why I bring my rejection letters with me to school visits, and I do it because I think kids somehow they see like celebrities, uh, movie stars or, or singers or whatever, and they think, oh, they never really struggled in their lives. They, they didn't really encounter a lot of the obstacles. But very often, these people who are so famous today, they struggled for years and years be before they became successful. And I want kids to know that just because something knocks you down in life doesn't mean it's the end of the world. You could still be successful if you keep trying. And you've got them uh, posted at your website publicly, where anybody can go and uh, relive Dan Getman's rejection if they if they've ever, if they're of a mind to. <laughs> yeah, my baseball card adventure series, which uh, starts with uh, Hannes and me. Uh, this uh, this book was rejected by ten different publishers. It took me uh, two years before I found a publisher for it. In fact, it was rejected twice by by some publishers. Scholastic rejected it once, uh, and they gave me some suggestions to make it better. And I, I made their, I took their suggestions and I revised the book and I submitted it to them again and they rejected it a second time. So, uh, you know, you, you can't give up. And I, I did get my revenge on Scholastic, by the way, because <laughs> after after the book was published and became successful, uh, they bought the rights to sell it at their book clubs and book fairs. So na 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 boo boo on them. <laughs> Well, I think you got your, your revenge on Scholastic by not reading Harry Potter. How, how have you escaped this uh, vortex that the, the rest of us have all been sucked into? <laughs> oh, I tried to read Harry Potter. I really did. I wanted to see what all the fuss was about, but uh, I just didn't get it. It's one of those, uh, there, occasionally there'll be a mainstream book like Twilight comes to mind. Uh, I haven't bothered to watch the movie. I feel I've suffered enough, but by golly, I read every last page of that first book. And then I had a, a, a friend's wife summarize uh, the other remaining books to me. So like I at least grokked, not its fullness, but a, um, I, I had enough of an idea of, oh, that's why the, 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 they're really talking about losing your virginity. Uh, and that's why this is a very popular series. Okay, I get it. I feel like I, I can talk uh, coherently. Uh, about this should it come up in my professional life i don't have to suffer anymore i can put this down and say it's not for me but i'm so glad the rest of you found it <laughs> yeah you know so I, I always feel a little bit funny when they they give out awards for the best book or the best movie or the best song or whatever because we are all so different and what is best for one person is not the best for somebody else and i i, I don't write book reviews because i don't want to evaluate someone else's work and I feel, just feel funny about awards being given out for the best of any kind of creative endeavor because it's just there's no best, you know. It's what's best for you. One hundred percent agree. I uh, remember when the Dark Knight wasn't even nominated for Best Picture. I said, "Up, oh, I'm done with the Oscars. You don't know what you're talking about." <laughs> <laughs> with 
the uh, what's um, what, what's well, I don't want to ask you how do you get your ideas because I know that's kind of a silly question. But how do you go about planning? I mean, 50, 59 books in, uh, and you're going to be writing until uh, you pull the laptop from your cold, dead hand, uh, which we assume is 100 years from now. That's going to be a lot of my weird school books yet to write. So how do you evaluate ideas? When do you know you've got something that could make a, a good weird, My Weird School edition? Yeah. And by the way, I know that at some point the series is going to end. You know, all good things come to an end. And uh, I don't know how long this thing is going to last. Uh, at some point... They're going to stop selling or or I will lose touch with my audience or the publisher will just decide we don't want to do this anymore. Um, but what I did from the start was I just I made a list of, of grownups who work at a school, you know, and I started out with the regular teacher, the principal, the art teacher, the music teacher, the gym teacher and so on. And after I had run through all of them, then I started, you know, going a little bit wider, like, you know, the uh, the therapy dog and the guy who mows the lawn and the security officer and and things like that. And now I'm really scraping the bottom of the barrel, actually. Um, I got now a Cub Scout leader. Uh, oh, Miss Porter isn't even a human being. Miss Porter <laughs> is like an Amazon Echo that comes to the school to uh, teach the kids uh, to, to just uh, be a substitute teacher for a week. So... Um, you know, people are always suggesting new ideas for me for my weird school books. I did the ice cream man recently. And, um, you know, when I was in that school and the kids suggested the dentist, I thought, okay, I haven't done a dentist before. Let's do the dentist. So that's how I come up with the new ideas. And obviously there are not 75 grownups who work at a school, but if you stretch your imagination a little bit, you can, you know, People can retire. People can die. You know, I might have to have the whole staff uh, uh, be removed and uh, uh, bring in new teachers and grownups to work at the school at some point. I don't know. I'll, I don't know what I'll do. But I will tell you that the current contract I have for the series, uh, My Weirderest School, uh, that's the newest series. It uh, We're up to, I've written six of them now. And there will be 12 altogether. So I have six more to write, which will take me over the next two years. And then the publisher will have to decide, do we want to keep this thing going or do we want to end it right there? So we'll, we'll see what happens in, in a year, year and a half. Yeah, difficult decision. Are we tired of this sweet, sweet gravy train? Hmm. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, at some point, sales might tail off. I The, the Baseball Card Adventure series that I did was – pretty popular in its day and now they hardly sell at all you know the things come and go i remember when a series of unfortunate events was huge like what 10 years ago mm -hmm. and they were sold millions and millions of copies of those books and then at some point it just like dropped off the table and now when i talk to kids i said do you read uh, the lemony snicket series the kids don't even know who lemony snicket is anymore so you know Things come to an end, and, and and I'll be psychologically prepared when my weird school is over. Well, I mean, at this point, because the first book was published, what year? 2004. I mean, at this point, you've cycled through multiple generations of, uh, of, of kid readers uh, who've gone on to, to graduate uh, and are now out and about in the world. And are, uh, some of them presumably have children that they're reading. My world, I get emails my from people too. like that all the time. They say, like, I used to read My Weird School when I was a kid. I say, thanks for making me feel old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but also thanks for uh, the support of the book and, and, and making you a huge success, you know. <laughs> I'll take uh, it. With, uh, well, let me ask you, you, you get emails from readers. One of my favorite questions to ask authors is, what is your, what is your favorite uh, reader reaction to something you've written? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's been a lot of funny ones and, you know, I could go into that. But really what what is what really knocks me out is when I get these incredible emails from parents and teachers and librarians telling me my son, my daughter, my student hated to read. They wouldn't pick up a book. Um, I was so worried about them. And then they started reading My Weird School or then they started reading your other books. And now all they want to do is read your books. And they're hiding under the covers with a flashlight, reading your books past their bedtime. 
And it makes me feel so good to have written some silly words on a page that can have such a positive impact in a kid's life. You know, I didn't get into this to save the world or anything. I just got into it because I had a knack for it. But if you can, if you can do something that will turn a reluctant reader into a kid who's really interested in reading, boy, that makes you really feel like you, you chose the right profession, you know, and, and you're not just doing this to make money or to, or to put food on the table. You're doing it because you're making the world a better place. And it, it, it's really rewarding. Yeah, no, when it uh, comes to making money, whenever I, I teach a class on writing, I, I, I usually start with, look, I have a background uh, in, um, in finance. I've been a stockbroker. I've been a day trader. If it's money that you're after, don't write books, for God's <laughs> sake. Get yourself some cash. Learn how to trade options. Let's do this thing. If you can read a chart and you can... Uh, and uh, you can figure out the fluctuations of the market. That's your money. And you could do that at a whole lot less time than it takes to, to physically write a book. There's, there's no reason to really get involved in, in, in writing. Uh, there, there might be a couple, but to the best of my knowledge, there's no reason without that love, that real drive behind it, that desire to create something. Yeah. It's anything in the creative arts. My son is a musician, you know, and anything in the creative arts, be music, acting, dancing, writing. It's a really tough way to make a living. And if you're going to do it, you better really love what you're doing. And you say that you, you didn't get into this to change the world. And obviously, I'm in the bag for, for children's books. Um, but I would argue that you've changed at least a small part of the world. If you've turned some reluctant readers around into making readers, uh, anytime you're out and about and you see an adult novelist that's doing well, if you meet James Patterson, by golly, he owes you a drink or a coffee, <laughs> he needs to shake his hands. I thank you for turning these reluctant readers around so that they were there when they got a little bit older for me. <laughs> and I'll say, like, uh, I've never met him personally, but uh, he he's really into the whole idea of getting kids to read, too. He's got a whole website. I think it's called Read Kiddo Read or something like that, where he recommends books that are good for reluctant readers. And uh, uh, for somebody who is who doesn't have to get down in the trenches uh, uh, with thus little people, um, he really is out there uh, promoting reading and literacy, and I got to hand it to him for that. Well, there's a, another prime example. I mean, if it was money he was interested or fame, he could have quit a long time ago. The the money's there, <laughs> but he's still <laughs> producing books and helping other authors, and people get cynical about that, but. My God, there has to be a genuine love of literature and, and writing and reading in there. He wouldn't be doing it. There's just life is short. There's lots of things you can do, especially if you've got millions of dollars. He could have retired a long time ago. So um, when uh, when you sit down, you get your, your idea uh, and you say, OK, well, today we, we're going to write about the, the guy that mows the lawn <laughs> or uh, wh whatever adult you pick that's going to be the impetus for the story. These are fully fleshed out stories. This isn't just, um, here, here's the funny things about this faculty member, let's move on. Yeah. So what, what makes a good story? Do you, do you plot ahead of time? How do you oh, yeah. come up with your, your concept? Oh, yeah. I'm in awe of these authors who can just sit down at their computer and stare at a blank screen and start typing. I'm not that way at all. I'm a planner myself. And uh, I used to uh, sort of outline my stories on the computer screen, you know, but I found that uh, as the outline got too long, it became difficult to cut and paste back and forth. So instead, I started using file cards, uh, just plain old three by five file cards. And I'll just start brainstorming. Uh, and I'll and any time an idea comes to mind, I'll, I'll just jot it down on a card, put it down, get another card, jot down, keep jotting down ideas on cards. And once I have like you know, 100, 200 cards, I'll start shuffling them around, changing the order, maybe laying them out on a flat surface and starting to change things around and sort of weave those uh, separate ideas into a story that makes sense from start to finish. And uh, that's how I plan out my stories. Then once I have like, you know, my outline finished, and that might take like a month just to do that, then I'll take the first card off the pile and I'll start to write chapter one. And I try and keep uh, like a My Weird School book, for instance, usually has about 10 chapters, nine to 11 chapters. And I try and keep them short, you know, under a thousand words for each chapter, because I want the kids to feel a sense of accomplishment quickly. So 
I, you know, I don't want any chapters to be 20 pages long. And um, that's basically my system for writing the stories. I try and start, uh, gra grab the, their attention in chapter one, um, hold their attention through the middle and end with a climactic knock your socks off surprise ending. Um, and that's what I do. <laughs> um, so if you've got a contract, you said you, you know, you're on a contract for at least what, six more books at the moment. Yeah. When you get something like that, um, when, uh, uh, how how do you prepare for that? Do you plan all six books at once or in different stages? How do you make sure you're going to be in a position, or is it one at a time? Um, one at a time, uh, actually. Yeah, I, uh, I I keep on my computer a file of uh, potential topics and potential titles. And after I finish one book, you know, I'll let a week go by or whatever. Uh, and then I'll sit down and I'll look at look at my list and I'll say like, OK, you know, what do I want to do next? What looks promising? That idea looked pretty good a month ago, but it doesn't look so hot now. Uh, this idea sounds better. Uh, maybe I'll do that and I'll think of a title that matches it and then I will pitch it to my editor. I, I don't just make the decision by myself. I I write a little uh, letter to my editor saying, uh, OK, here's what I have in mind. I'd like to do this topic. Uh, this is what, what my thinking is. I think the title should be this. What do you think? And he'll get back to me and say, like, hmm, that sounds good. Or eh, I don't know about that one. But <laughs> usually uh, he he uh, gives me the go, go ahead. And I it takes me, I'd say, about a month or so to write each My Weird School book. Uh, the Baseball Card Adventure books, I spend like uh, six months on these guys. Uh, because they involve a lot more research. And and the hardest thing I ever had to write uh, was my series called uh, The Genius Files, which is for older kids. Uh, I spent about a year on each one of these books, uh, and that was really hard. But it's really fun to write My Weird School because I can, I can, I can knock them out quickly and then and put them behind me. Well, you say that, but a month is, uh, is a fairly large in investment of time. What, what does that month look like for you uh, from start to finish? Well, uh, I'm a morning person, I would say. So I do almost all my writing uh, between, you know, eight o'clock in the morning and noon, uh, because after that, my brain is kind of shot and I, I just can't hold my concentration. But um, I spend probably more time, more than the time I spend writing is the time I spend doing stuff like this, doing a podcast doing emails, uh, arranging school visits or doing school visits and Skypes uh, and marketing and all that kind of businessy stuff that we do to promote ourselves. Only a very short amount of my time is actually spent writing. And when I know that I only have a few hours in a day to do my writing, I find that I can, I can really uh, get a lot accomplished in that short period of time. If I gave myself the whole day to do the same thing, I probably would waste a lot of the time. So I find that giving myself like a false deadline forces me to be more productive than I would be otherwise. So how do you know if you've had a productive day? Um, if I can get like a rough draft of a chapter, I feel like uh, I've accomplished what I want to accomplish. And then the next day, before I start on the next chapter, I will look over the chapter I wrote previously and I'll fiddle around with it, you know, make it smoother, change the sentences a little bit, whatever, to make it uh, better. And then um, at the end, when I finish the whole book, I'll read the whole thing all like in one shot, try and make it better again. Then I show it to my wife, Nina. She reads everything I write and, and she'll, you know, find some mistakes that I made or, or point out some inconsistencies that I need to correct. And after she reads it, then I send it to my editor. He will read it. And he will uh, make some suggestions to make it better. And so by the time the book is printed, it's it's been through many, many eyes. And hopefully we've gotten all the mistakes out of it. Every so often still, you know, a book will come out and some I'll get some email from some kids saying on page 60, you said blank. But on page 45, it says blank. And that doesn't make any sense. And I look at it and I say, like, oh, the kid is right. And then we have to make changes uh, in the next time the book is reprinted. <laughs> How uh, how do you how have you learned to deal with that? Because that's got to be the most agonizing thing in the world is to know there's something you can't change immediately. 
Oh yeah, one in one of the books. I'm not even sure which the which title it was. Oh, it was <laughs> it was Miss Newman isn't human, um, and uh, all these eyes had looked at the book. Mine, my wife's, my editor, the proofreaders, and then the book came out, and on one of the pages, Newman is spelled wrong. Oh. And I, I thought, oh, man, how could that have happened? How could that have slipped past all of us? So that drives you crazy. But it happens, you know? What are you going to do? I find a way to go through life without ever making a mistake, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> if you right. figure that out, you let me know. That's right. <laughs> so um, what was my uh, next question? Oh, um, with a series like this, because I... I I have the impression that although these books are all interconnected, we're dealing with lots of the same characters being mentioned. Uh, any at any point in any of the uh, iterations from my weird school to my weirder school to my weirder rest school, great title by the way, um, that any new reader can just come along and pick up whatever book their library happens to have on the day and get sucked in. So how do you balance that? And also, how do you keep your continuity straight for those that do read an order and want to make sure that everybody's consistent and who they should be? Yeah. There are some kids who who insist upon reading a series in chronological order. Um, that's fine. And I would say that in my series, The Genius Files, it makes sense to read them in chronological order. Uh, with My Weird School and with The Baseball Card Adventures too. There is an order, but you can read them in any order. Uh, and I, I've written them that way because not everybody has the ability to, to get 59 books and read them in order. It's not that easy. Um, so, like, sometimes things happen. Like, in my weird school, uh, Miss Daisy, the teacher, she uh, falls in love with Mr. Mackey, the reading specialist, and they get married. And they have a baby. Jackie Mackey, by the way. And uh, the kids advance from second grade to third grade. So if you really follow the story carefully, there is a certain amount of continuity. But I think if somebody reads them out of order, they can still enjoy them. Uh, by the way, you said that you really like the title, My Weirderest School. I love uh, it. Yeah, what happened was, it's interesting. Um, I had done My Weird School, and then My Weird School Days, and then My Weirder School, and then My Weirdest School. And by the way, if it were up to me, I would have just numbered the books one through 59 and called them all My Weird School. But the publisher broke them into separate uh, series because they can sell more books that way. Um, a book with a number one on it sells better than a book with a number 22 on it. Anyway, I, I had done, comic book logic. That makes sense. Yeah, I had done the, the four series and then they said, OK, we want to do another series. So we tried to think of a title better than my weirdest school. So the best we could come up with was my weird school year, which nobody loved too much. And then I was at a school visit and very frequently, it's the school visit that really inspire me. I was at a school visit and some kid raised his hand and said, uh, what's the next series gonna be called? And I said, well, we we're thinking of calling it my weird school year. And the kid said, you should call it my weirderest school. And I said, you, sir, are a genius. So now that's how we got the title, My Weirderest School. And this book, the newest book, Miss Porter is Out of Order, is dedicated to the kid who gave me that idea. Aw. <laughs> is that accompanied by a check for royalties for life or? <laughs> <laughs> Just his name in the book. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> what a wonderful thrill. Uh, I bet he's over the moon. Have you heard back from him? I did send a copy of the book to uh, to him at his school. I haven't heard from him himself, but I, I hope he's happy. <laughs> I would have been just beside myself. I might not have ever written a book myself. I'd be like, why would I want to put my name on a different book? It's already there. <laughs> <laughs> These things, but if you had to guess, and I'm assuming this is something you've given a fair amount of thought to, why do you think that My Weird School has been as popular as it has? A uh, couple things. Certainly, uh, the rhyming titles um, help. Uh, kids love rhymes, and uh, so each book has a rhyming title, so that's that's attractive, and it ties to all the books together. The artwork is wonderful. I got to hand it to uh, my illustrator, Jim Jim Pilat. Uh, Jim and I have been working on this series for 15 years now, and we we've, we've only met once in person, by the way. Um, in our he lives in Arizona, and I live in New York City. 
so his, his illustrations are wonderful. And I think uh, the the look of them, they they all look different, but the same at the same time, you know? So that's that's a, an attractive part of it. I think also part of it is just the attitude of the kids or the main character, AJ. He's got a, kind of got this snarky, silly attitude that uh, kids are attracted to. And kids like the idea of grown-ups doing dumb things. So I think those things combine to to make the series successful. And and to be honest, you know, when something is successful, uh, word of mouth spreads, kids start talking. And when you start reading something that you like, you want to read all of the books in the series. So that has, you know, success breeds success, in, in other words. And when you're working uh, with 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 your illustrator, with Jim, how uh, how much are, are you collaborating? Is it you write the text and then he does his thing? Or do you send him ideas that you have for individual illustrations? It's almost entirely separate, actually. Um, he starts working on the cover at the same time that I start working on the writing. So if I tell him, okay, uh, it's going to be called Miss Porter is Out of Order, and it's going to be about a, like a, a digital, a personal digital assistant, uh, and it's going to like sit on a desk, you know, and it looks like the Amazon Echo. So Jim draws this and he completely invents the look of that particular character. Um, and so he does the cover. And then um, when I finish the manuscript, I send it to my editor. My editor sends it to Jim and Jim will look at will read the manuscript and he'll decide every few pages what scene lends itself to an illustration because there's. There's black and white illustrations on the inside. Um, I'll find one for you. Um, so he'll he'll find a, you know a scene that he thinks lends itself to an illustration. He decides where to place them, uh, and I often don't see the illustrations until the book is close to being printed, and then I'll look them over just to make sure there isn't anything that's obviously incorrect. But we work very separately, but very well together too. I don't know if he ever sends you like, hey, I'd love to do this. <laughs> I want to draw this. Will you write this book? Um, a few times he've gi he's given me ideas, actually. Once or twice uh, he has given me ideas that we've used. In fact, Jim and I are now collaborating on a graphic novel, uh, My Weird School. Uh, yeah, graphic novels, as you probably know, are, are huge right now. Um, and uh, the publisher, HarperCollins, said, hey, would you guys be interested in, in doing one? And we both said, yes. So uh, uh, we're working on Mr. Corbett is in orbit and I've already done my part and it was really interesting and challenging because I had to write it in a completely different way than the way I usually write it. I didn't type it out on my computer. I drew storyboards and drew stick figures for Jim to follow and um, it was challenging. I'd never done that kind of writing before. And now he's doing the illustrations. And I don't know when this book is coming out, but uh, he's got a big he's got 96 full color pages that he's got to work on. So that's going to keep him busy for a while. It's a lot of pressure. <laughs> so, yeah. but I'm sure he's up to it. I mean, 59 uh, books and he did plus all the uh, all the other uh, supplemental books. He, he must enjoy doing this. <laughs> yeah, and he also does other books for other people. He does advertising work. He's done some board games. He's a really talented illustrator. And I want to talk about the genius files and, and writing action and adventure uh, for kids, but I'd, I'd be uh, wasting an opportunity if I didn't talk to you a little bit about writing humor for kids um, before we leave my weird school behind. So what is the secret to writing humor for, for kids? What tips do you have for us? Yeah, I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> And uh, it's a little I, bit like asking, hey, be funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know that it can be taught, really. I mean, I, I am trying to write. I don't always write funny. Uh, I mean, The Genius Files isn't that funny. And some of my other books are, are not that funny. But My Weird School, I am obviously trying to be funny. But I don't feel like I'm I'm working hard at it. <laughs> And I don't feel like I can I can tell people how to do it other than to just if you're funny, be yourself. If you're not funny, don't try and be funny. You know, um, I I guess the biggest thing is you have to, kids and human beings uh, crave novelty, and if you surprise them 
And if you surprise them in un unusual ways, it will be amusing. <laughs> but, but I can't give you like, uh, you know, specific tips on how to how to write funny. It's just either you got it or you don't have it. You know what I mean? Oh, I, I think so. <laughs> uh, but I was really hoping you had the secret just like buried in back there in a, in a shelf you could pull out and say, Rob, do this. And from now on, you will be as funny as Dan Gutman. And I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a lot of uh, authors will say like, you know, what's the secret to being successful? And I don't know what's what works for me might not work for another person. What works for another person might not work for me. Um, there's no secrets. It's really just you have to like bust your ass for 20 years doing all the wrong things until you find the thing that really works for you. And and that's that's what I've found has, you know, I tried writing screenplays that didn't work. I tried writing uh, newspaper articles and magazine articles and books for grownups, and none of them were successful for me. Uh, I've written a lot of children's books that were not successful for me, but a few of them have been. And, and, and uh, it's just a matter of, and I always tell my kids and I tell young people, try everything. Find out what doesn't work. Like Thomas Edison working on the light bulb, you know, he tried like 10,000 different filaments before he hit on the one that worked. You got to try a million things that don't work before you find the thing that actually does. Yeah, then one of the, the great things about my weird school is I don't have to do any research. I just make up crazy stuff in my head and write it down. But when I'm doing the baseball court adventures, when I'm doing uh, the Genius Files, when I'm doing Flashback 4, I spend a lot of time trying to read everything I could learn about that subject. And uh, with Flashback 4, this is a, a, a newer series, and basically... Uh, my hobby growing up was always photography. Uh, in fact, I wanted to be a photographer when I was a kid. And I had a dark room down in my basement. I used to develop my own pictures down there before digital photography. And so I thought it would be cool to write about some kids who travel through time with a camera trying to take photographs of things that were never photographed before. So I started to think of historical events that were never photographed, like uh, Abraham Lincoln delivering the Gettysburg Address. There's plenty of photographs of Abraham Lincoln, but there's no picture of him delivering the most famous speech in American history. So I sent these kids back in time to try and shoot that photograph. Um, in the next book in the series, they went back to 1912 to try and shoot a picture of the Titanic while it was sinking. And uh, that was interesting. So I had to research the Titanic like crazy. So what are uh, the, the parameters that they're there taking a picture of the Titanic sinking, but they're not bringing like extra life jackets? <laughs> well, they didn't think that they were going to have to, but it turns out that they did have to. Uh, I don't want to give the story away, but they okay. were in a lifeboat. Uh, they got themselves into a lifeboat and had to take the picture from there. <laughs> um, but in the third book in the series, uh, they go back to the year 79 to try and take a photograph of Mount Vesuvius as it's erupting before it buries the city of Pompeii for 1,500 years. And the fourth and final book in the series is uh, the Hamilton Bird Duel. They go back to 1804 and try and uh, shoot a picture to, uh, uh, not a picture, I should say, this time they're shooting a video of the duel because of, see, the thing is with the duel, everybody knows that Alexander Hamilton got shot and killed, okay? But nobody knows who shot first or exactly how the duel went down, or even if Hamilton got off a shot at all. So this time, they go back in time with a video camera to try and shoot a video of the duel. So I had to do a lot of research into a Hamilton and Burr. So with a book like that, I'm assuming that that's going to be closer to the almost year-long process of the Genius Files, Jim? Yeah? Uh, almost. Not as much. The, the reason why the Genius Files uh, was harder to do is because in the Genius Files, the kids are traveling cross-country uh, in an RV with their parents over summer vacation while these bad guys are chasing them the whole time. So I had to plot out their route from San Francisco to Washington, D.C., using actual roads and actual locations along the way. And it was a tremendous amount of work to do. And uh, with a topic like the Titanic, I only had to research one thing, the Titanic in 1912. With the Genius Files, I had to research a hundred different things. And that's why it was the hardest thing I ever had to write. 
I mean, really, of all the things you've written, the, the genius files is the hardest. Yeah, I was actually relieved when that one was over because I didn't want to do any more. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> kid, kids have said to me, like, why don't you do more genius files? Have the kids go on a European vacation. And I say, like, forget about it. That's not going to happen. <laughs> it's so... Um... Uh, when you're uh, working on a, on a longer book like that, what, how does that process change? Is it still looking for a thousand words a day? Um, are you a little bit more verbose since you've got a little bit more room to run with? Not much. It's still very tight prose uh, throughout, uh, but it's, it's a little bit more languid uh, than the, the My Weird School books. Oh, yeah. Uh, the My Weird School books are about 8,000 words each. Um, and my other books for older kids are usually like between 30 and 35,000 words each. So writing for an older audience gives me more room to make chapters longer, to elaborate on things, to describe things in more detail. Uh, but still, I, I still try and keep it as tight as possible because I'm paranoid about boring the readers. Yes, and, and, and with good reason. <laughs> they get I always uh, like to say that it's uh, there's never been a better time in the history of the world, one, to be alive, uh, but two, to be an author, uh, because there's more literate people than there ever have been, in part because there's more people than there ever have been, uh, to the best of our, our knowledge. Um, but the downside is there's more distraction than there ever has been, more competition for everybody's time. You know, Charles Dickens wrote a novel and it came to your local pub and everybody came out to, to hear it read. And that was the big event. That was your, your summer blockbuster, your Christmas blockbuster. That was the deal right there. Yeah, Whereas yeah. now, of course, you bore a child at the end of one chapter and they set it down even once and they pick up their PlayStation controller or they check out uh, something online. You might have lost him forever. Yeah. And when I was a kid, you know, everybody listened to the same radio station pretty much or two. Uh, we went to the same movies. If a TV show was hot, everybody in America watched it. And now there's a million different TV stations, a million different uh, XM radio stations they could listen to. The Internet is an unlimited amount of, of, of material. And to get kids interested in reading a book is more challenging than ever. So, we, you know, we do the best we can to compete against the, the other uh, media. Well, obviously, uh, you've, you've got more books coming, uh, and you keep finding ways to overcome this environment. So how are you doing, and how are you standing out? <clears throat> uh, I'm just doing what I always did, Rob. You know, I try and write stuff that kids will be attracted to. Um, I try and stay on top of things like, you know, the fact that Miss Miss Porter is an Amazon Echo uh, is uh, I, I'm trying to uh, write about something that kids are familiar with. You know, um, I've got uh, the Houdini book coming out next year sometime. Um, I'm doing another series, actually, uh, that I didn't even tell you about. You don't even know about yet. It's going to be. Uh, I'm sorry. I said, this is an exclusive. I'm sitting forward. Continue. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the Houdini book, by the way, is, is coming out from a different publisher. It's going to be published by Holiday House. And, and you know the final title on that one? Uh, I don't know the title. If you have a great idea for a title, let me know. <laughs> um, but actually, the, the plot of the story is going to be this. Ki you know how Harry Houdini, before he died, he said, if there is a way for me to come back after I'm dead, I will find a way to do it, okay? So in my story, this kid in the present day, um, he communicates with Houdini by text message. <laughs> so <laughs> so that's, the, that's the plot of the story. If you want to brainstorm a title for me, that would be great. Um, the other thing, the, the new series that I'm working on, and, and it hasn't even started yet, but it's going to be um, biographies of famous people, but instead of focusing on the, the conventional stuff, they were born, they accomplished this, they died, and so on, like those big head biographies, you know, I'm going to be focusing on the unusual aspects of their lives. You know, like, let's say, uh, Abraham Lincoln, instead of talking about, you know, his presidency and, and, and the Civil War and all that stuff, I'm going to talk about the fact that Lincoln was the only president in American history who patented an invention uh, 
um, with the patent office. He patented a device to keep boats afloat when they are um, going through locks. You know, <laughs> this is before he was president. And and Lincoln was also the um, he's also a member of the uh, Wrestling Hall of Fame. <laughs> you know, weird facts like this uh, will be about uh, these biographies will be about the obscure and unusual aspects of these people's lives. I also don't know what this is going to be called either. <laughs> well, it sounds it's like a heck of a lot of fun, though, to get to learn all this uh, interesting things. Yes, the first uh, the first person I'm writing about is going to be Albert Einstein. So I'm, right now I'm, I'm reading books about Einstein. And how unique to be able to... to I mean, I'm assuming you cover the, you know, the, the, the general information, the theory of relativity is going to be in there someplace. Uh, but, but the focus, you say, is just going to be strange oddball things that most books don't cover exactly the the first couple of pages will be about you know stuff your teacher wants you to know and the rest of the book will be stuff you can tell your teacher that your teacher doesn't know <laughs> oh that's great you'd be armed with all kinds of knowledge going into class and uh uh, and the teacher will be talking to you and I, well, you think you're so smart teacher just wait for your moment did you know <laughs> that's right that's right and, and part of that was inspired by these uh, these fast facts books I've done f for my weird school, which are nonfiction books. But but the, what I'm talking about are going to be biographies, and they're going to be published by a Nor Norton Books for Young Readers. Fantastic. And then, uh, oh, I'm excited about this idea of uh, of text from Houdini, who's finally he had to wait this long to to prove he's uh, he's in the afterlife until we finally developed texting technology, and now. <laughs> yeah, but I'm also yeah, yeah. I'm chuckling because I know that's a book that would have gotten banned in my hometown. Oh, it's the occult. <laughs> really? Oh, sure. What, what was your hometown? Harry Potter. Uh, my my hometown was Lebanon, Indiana. And if there was a book that uh, I think we banned the my the worst witch, too satanic. Didn't didn't want to take the chance of uh, our 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 uh, young Christian children finding out that there's a thing called witches and being led astray. <laughs> You know, speaking of Houdini, uh, it's interesting that like um, Houdini died in 1926, but he's one of those figures like Marilyn Monroe, like Babe Ruth, that all kids know about, even though they died so, so long ago. Uh, and Houdini actually lived eight blocks from where I am right now. Um, uh, I live in New York City. I live at 104th Street. Houdini lived at 113th Street. And there's one of those plaques on his on his wall that says he lived there for the last 20 years of his life. And I just kept walking by his house and thinking, like, that's somebody I'd like to write about. So I did some research and came up with this idea about him. And, and uh, I finished the book. I, I think it's going to be really good. I think kids are really going to like it. Why do you think that he's had so much staying power in a world where we've got, you know, Penn and Teller, David Copperfield? Chris Angel, all all these modern magicians where we can see them in bright, high definition yeah. uh, with modern music and everything else. But still, Harry Houdini captures the imagination. Yeah, maybe yeah. part of it is the name. You know, the name is intriguing. By the way, that wasn't his name. His name was Eric Weiss. <laughs> Best uh, marketing decision he ever made. <laughs> yeah, there was a uh, there was a French magician named Robert Houdin uh, in the 1800s. And uh Houdini, uh, I should say, Eric Weiss simply decided to add an I to the end of Houdin and called himself Houdini. And uh, that's a really intriguing name. I think these people who die young, you know, are like James Dean, you know, are very intriguing. Houdini, you probably heard the story. He died. He got punched in the stomach. Did you ever hear that story? Okay. Well, I know he got punched in the stomach, and he eventually died, but not right away. Am I am I remembering correct? It was. Why, nine, why am it, I guessing? You're the expert. How <laughs> did Houdini die? <laughs> it was. It was nine days later. Uh, he was. Uh, he was uh, talking to some some college students, and Houdini had a reputation of being able to take a punch. You know, so this student said to him, uh, "Mr. Houdini, would it be okay if I were to uh, punch you in the stomach?" <laughs> <laughs> as hard as I could. And Houdini said, yeah, okay. And before he had a chance to tense up his stomach muscles, the guy hauled off and socked him like five times in the stomach and it ruptured his appendix. And, uh, and he got uh, what per perin perin perinitis, I believe it's called. And he died 10 days later. He was, uh, he was in his early fifties when he died. And, and so I think that's part of the intrigue about Houdini. 
did anything ever any recriminations for the the puncher? I don't think so. I think there was talk about putting him up on trial, but uh, I think it was. I think Houdini had some long-standing um, physical issues. He had subjected his subjected his body to a lot of really tough things over his career, and he was he was um, falling apart in other ways anyway. So I don't think any charges were filed, or, or nobody ever went to jail or anything. Some somebody like that, or you know, even the old style uh, starvation artist, or somebody like uh, our modern starvation artist Christian Bale, who's five different sizes depending on what movie you're watching him in. Those people fascinate me because I I have a creative drive that will get me up in a nice comfy chair with my cup of coffee uh, to work and open up a vein and then pour it out on the page. Um, but I don't have that that need to really disfigure myself or or. or uh, encounter great physical harm i don't know if you if, if if you're doing any of that in the course of writing your books what do you, what do you suppose it is about those folks that that, that makes them that way uh, yeah well, we writers we don't have to lose 40 pounds uh <laughs> in fact we could gain 40 pounds and nobody would know the difference right sure uh, i'm doing it for a book <laughs> yeah, yeah. um but uh, I guess the, it's the Hollywood thing. I just saw a, a movie that just came out called Brittany Runs a Marathon. And the actress, I don't remember her name, she uh, she lost 40 pounds during the making of the film on purpose. And I guess um, some roles, uh, they really want to get into it. And that's they, they have to do that. Or they just decide that they want to do that. I don't know. But... The nice thing you know, about doing what we do is that like, uh, you know, we could be sort of like have this degree of fame, you know, but you don't have to walk down the street being pestered by people, you know, asking for autographs or or or, or uh, bothering you in restaurants. We nobody knows what we look like. <laughs> I can I, if I saw J.K. Rowling walking down the street, I wouldn't recognize her. She'd just be some other blonde lady walking down the street. Oh, I would. <laughs> you would. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Well, I, I say that. I don't know. She changed her hair a little bit. She looked a little different. Who knows? I, I, she could walk right by me. Uh, I've got a... Go ahead. I was just going to say that other than Stephen King, I can't think of an author I would... A famous author I would recognize walking down the street. I don't know what James Patterson looks like. Do you? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I stand corrected. <laughs> I waited... Back when I'm on my tables days, I waited on Jared from Subway before his, you know, his unfortunate downfall. Back when he was at the height of his Subway fame for having lost all that weight, uh, and it was a, it was a, it was a buffet uh, type situation, which was a sweet deal for me. It was a dinner theater, and everybody went and got their own plate. All I had to do was serve drinks, and then I got a percentage of their total ticket for the the, the play plus the. Oh, it was a great deal. Nice. Anyway, poor Jared is sitting right up front, and everybody's watching what he's eating. Like, Jared, are you going to have some dessert? You know you shouldn't, Jared. You need to go have a Subway sandwich. Like, that's too famous. I don't, wanna, I don't want that experience. I wouldn't want to be famous like that. But I've got a, a, a somewhat famous, uh, locally famous author friend whose name I won't say because I don't want to embarrass him. Uh, but, you know, we go places. We'll, we'll hang out at a Panera or whatever. Uh, nobody recognizes him. Nobody cares. But the moment we step foot into an author's conference or someplace where... Uh, people, you know, people are readers, and they they know who he is. Mm -hmm. By golly, it's like walking around with Tom Cruise. <laughs> people come running up. Yeah, you can't get I, a whole uh, conversation I, without somebody interrupting. I recently uh, met R. L. Stein. Actually, um, he lives. A bunch of authors live w near where I live, so we often kind of get together just for informal dinners, you know. So I got to meet R. L. Stein, and we just went to a little diner, you know. And I kind of assumed that, like, people were going to recognize him and come over to the table, pestering him, asking for autographs, whatever. Uh, nobody did. Uh, so, you know, he, he can walk around New York City in an anonymity, which is nice. Um, but I suppose if he went to, like, a literary thing, everybody would be all over him. Oh, for sure. Or if he wore a Goosebumps t-shirt and people started to put two and two together. <laughs> He's That's the nice thing about being an author is you're, you're famous for people sitting in, you know, their comfy pants. They're reading you. And sometimes they don't even care who the author's name is until they know they love the book. Um, yeah, it's yeah. Not, you're not an actor where you're right there and they can see every last aspect of you and they're going to memorize your face. We can work in our pajamas if we want to. It's great. 
but we were talking about artists that, that messed themselves up and I want to pivot back. because I've got another burning question for you about my weird school um, <laughs> before I forget it. But I wanted to, to mention just something that, that has um, endlessly fascinated me a little bit it is um, one of my favorite writer directors. A lot of people favorite is uh, Adam McKay who made that wonderful movie vice. One of my favorite movies of last year uh, mm -hmm. about Dick Cheney. Uh, okay. And he wrote it and he did a lot of research on Dick Cheney. That makes sense. You're going to make a Dick Cheney movie. You better do your research. But he also nearly had a heart attack because he was smoking, I think, a carton of cigarettes a week. And he was eating a pack of donuts every morning and all of other all of Dick Cheney's other habits because it really got him into the headspace of Dick Cheney. And like I get Christian Bale putting on the weight because he's got to be on screen looking the part. But, dude, you're right in the screenplay and you're behind the camera. Why are you nearly having a heart attack? To, if the research, if your Dick Cheney connection was just slightly off, but you didn't almost have a heart attack, I would still say that was a good day's work. Maybe that was just his excuse to eat a lot of donuts. You ever think about that? <laughs> might be it. Maybe he got to a certain age. Like, you know what? I've always wanted to chain smoke and eat donuts. And by golly, writing about Dick Cheney and makes that happen for me. That's probably it. <laughs> he, he does some really good stuff. Am I am I also right that he and Will Ferrell uh, are the producers of that show Succession? You ever yes. Watched Succession? Yeah. I'm uh, on episode four. Oh, it's great. Love that show. And There's uh, so I love many great TV shows. I feel like it's TV homework. People are for, I've got like a stack. And like, if I ever get through the books, then maybe I'll get through all the TV. But yeah. I've enjoyed the first four episodes. We live in an age where there's so much content hitting us of, of books to read, TV shows to watch, albums to listen to. I could never catch up in a million years if I tried. And it's it's kind of intimidating, actually. In some ways, it's a good problem to have because I remember, you know, I remember the seven, the I'm sorry, the, the 80s. Uh, when, you know, did you like that Batman movie? That's your superhero movie. Now wait three years before another one comes out. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, yeah. But I hear kids complaining these days, like, oh, we only got five movies, five superhero movies this summer. Then that's when old man Robbie comes out. And like, back in my day, we had to wait. <laughs> what are you complaining about? 10 sport, miles kids? to school in the snow, you know? <laughs> But the burning question I wanted to make sure I ask you about, because I'm I'm still hanging, clinging to this idea, I'm going to tease out the secret from you of how to write humor. It's going to happen. Um, if you're writing a thousand words a day and you're doing 10 to 12 chapters, theoretically, even if you're taking weekends off, two weeks in, you've got a draft, right? But if it's taken 30 days, there's something else that's happening. Is it just that heavy revision? What else is happening? It's that heavy revision. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Well, what I like to do, and I, I think other authors do this too, is uh, after I finish a rough draft of something, I like to put it aside for at least a couple of days so that my brain sort of um, forgets about it a little bit. So that, that, that way, when I pick it up again and read it, it feels fresh. And, and when, when kids, ask, kids ask me for, for a writing tip, I say, here's, a here's the tip that I use that probably will work for you. When you write something, okay, look at it and read it out loud. And while you're reading it out loud, here's the, the secret. Here's the secret, Rob. Okay, I'm leaning forward. I'm ready. Okay, me too. Pretend that you're somebody else. Pretend that you're a stranger. Pretend that you're a teacher or your friend. And while you're reading what you wrote, almost through somebody else's eyes, you could see the mistakes that you made and you could see how you could make your writing better or funnier or whatever. And that's what I do in my writing. I, I, I read it again, pretending that I'm somebody else. And that's the secret. <laughs> i tell you what I'm going to do is I'm going to get myself a carton of cigarettes and a pack of donuts. I'm going to pretend I'm Dick Cheney. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the other uh, question about humor I wanted to ask you, and then and then we'll, we'll move on. Uh, but I wanted to ask, because you're writing about um, teachers and figures of authority, but then you're turning around and you're doing school visits, what's that fine line that you're walking there between? You want to make fun and you want to, I assume you want you want to be on the kids' side. If you got to pick between the kids and the faculty for the kids' book, you want the kids uh, more than you want to be on the side of the faculty. But have you crossed that line where you just you said something that was a little bit too true about a particular profession and like a principal and now a principal is giving you a sideways look at school? Uh, hmm, interesting. Um, I actually uh, and 
I think every author gets a certain amount of flack. You know, it, as 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 much as you try and um, please everybody, there's always going to be people who are offended by something that you've written, no matter how sanitized it is, you know. And there are topics that I've thought were completely innocuous. And then I get an email from somebody saying, I was deeply offended by that thing you wrote on page 64 of, you know, blah, blah, blah. And just last week it happened to me. Uh, I got an email from somebody who complained that I had written uh, a character was walking around like he was drunk. And the characters, uh, the uh, the email, the person who was complaining said, uh, I don't want my third and fifth graders to know about being drunk. That has no place in a children's book, you know. And I, th I thought, uh, what's the big deal? I mean, kids of everybody from all ages knows that alcohol exists and then grownups sometimes drink it and that they behave in unusual ways. But this woman was deeply offended by that. And I've had other people who were offended by the word hate, you know. Each My Weird School book starts off with the, the line, my name is AJ and I hate something, school or spiders or whatever. And people would say, well, you use the word hate in a book, it's promoting hatred. And I'm thinking like, come on. <laughs> you know? uh, so, Just a general concept is being promoted. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and I don't know if you have found this, but it, throughout the course of my career, I have found that um, – uh, stuff that I wrote uh, 20 or 30 years ago, I shouldn't say 30, 20 years ago is no longer acceptable today, you know, and you have to be very careful that like it's a fine line between teasing and bullying, for instance, you know, the characters in My Weird School tease each other a lot, but I have to make sure that they don't bully each other because bullying is, you know, verboten. Uh, so you have to be careful about things like that. And uh you know, um, I have not found that I've ever lost a school visit because someone thought that my books were offensive, but it's possible that I lost school visits and didn't know it because they never called me at all. Yeah, yeah you, you don't know what you don't know, I suppose. You have to be very careful about what you write, and, and no matter how careful you are, there's still going to be someone who's, who's offended by something. I've had my, uh, people try to ban my weird school from a whole school system because they thought uh, just AJ's attitude was uh, disrespectful to grownups. Oh, <laughs> were there no students in that school who were disrespectful to students that the children might relate to? <laughs> I think just the kids in my books were disrespectful and they didn't want the kids in, in their schools to, to read that kind of material. It happens. Well, I, wanna, I always want to look at the counter argument because I've talked with a number of editors and, and authors now that are uh, employing things like sensitivity readers for uh, issues that you want to be sensitive about. You want to make sure that you're uh, that you're presenting a culture accurately. If you're writing about somebody who's not you, maybe go reach out to a member of that community, get their take on it, and do some listening and not just talking. I think all of that is admirable. But I also think that if you want to stand up and do something artistic of any kind, sooner or later, one, you're going to make a mistake. God knows that happens to me all the time. Uh, and two, somebody somewhere is going to be offended or unhappy about it for some reason. And if you run around trying to think of this poor woman who uh, doesn't want you to use the word hate because the concept of hate is terrible uh, in any way, like you have to kind of balance that out. This one person versus the enormous readership that my weird school has and they're all enjoying it. Yeah, I'd say that 99 percent of the feedback I get is positive. Uh, just uh, people t telling me how the books have turned their kids on to reading. And, and you have to bow, you have to uh, put as more weight into that feedback than the very occasional uh, critiques you get from people who just get angry at anything. <laughs> My child was killed by an Alexa machine, and now I can't stand looking at the cover of your book with an Alexa-like machine on it. <laughs> right. <laughs> For that one person, no, this probably won't be the book for you. <laughs> Some people are just looking for an, a reason to get angry, you know? That's true also. And that's, I think that's part of uh, something that social media has inflicted on us, among other things, is that um, constant raising of was it serotonin. 
uh, some chemical in your brain that, 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 that gets excited when you get to hate and you mm -hmm. need your two minutes hate. And if you haven't had any hate all morning, well, it's time to start scrolling and find something to hate. And it's so easy to just write some comments, you know, some angry comment at, and you're anonymous. Nobody knows who you are. And then I think it probably maybe transfers to your real life when you, you in the real world, you see something that bothers you and you just instead of, you know, censoring yourself or just taking it with a grain of salt, you just shout out and express your anger. I don't know. It's a weird world we live in. It is. And it's, uh, I don't know, like compared to times of bubonic plague. I'll take this. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's overall getting better. That's right. So have I uh, worn you out completely or do you have a little time left yet to talk about school visits and social media? Absolutely. I'm an expert in school visits. That's okay, so obviously, my next question to you is, Dan Gutman, have you ever seen a flying saucer and do you believe in them? What does that have to do with school visits? <laughs> Nothing at all. <laughs> oh, OK. Uh, the question, um, I've never seen one, uh, but my thinking is that there's, with so many millions and billions of planets out there in, in the universe, that it would be arrogant for us to consider ourselves the only one that has life on it. So I would not rule out the possibility. Fair enough. How's that? <laughs> I love it. I asked. I, I I started asking this question. I've been asking every. You never know what answer you're going to get. Um, for those who just listened to the previous episode with Sharon Draper, if you hang in there long enough, we talk about her visiting the White House and we talk about her Coretta Scott King Awards. But if you hang in there, she's got a bit of a flying saucer story that's that's, that's worth hanging around for. Really, I'll have to so listen. Let's, uh, to go ahead. I'll have to listen to that. As promised, let's let's talk school visits. So okay. what, uh, what's the secret to a successful school visit, getting one set up and then uh, executing? Yeah, I, uh, I've i been doing this for a long time, and uh, I started it. I didn't even know that authors did school visits, actually. I used to live across the street from a children's book author named Diane DeSalvo. Um, she does picture books. And uh, she told me, hey, I, I um, one of the things I do is I visit schools and they pay me. And I said, what? Are you crazy? And she said, yeah. So I went to one of her school visits and uh, I said, that looks like fun. I could do that, you know, and and I started doing it at first for free uh, because nobody's going to pay you if you don't have any reputation or track record. So I started doing it for free and I found that I was I, I was really good at it and I really liked doing it. So I started doing it more and more and I started charging money. And as I got better and and word of mouth spreads, if you're good, people talk. And I started doing more of them and I started raising my rates so I could charge more money doing it. And I realized that, especially when I was starting out, that your publisher doesn't do a whole lot for you when it comes to promotion and publicity. You know, they're not going to send you on book tours. They're not going to invest a lot of money in you. So it's really up to you to promote yourself. And I said, I'm going to go out there. I'm going to do as many school visits as I can. And I'm going to come to a school. Nobody will have heard of me. But by the end of the day, 500 kids are going to think I'm their favorite author. And one year I did 100 school visits. You know, I visited 100 different schools. And little by little, you know, you spread the word. And it's, I found it to be the most uh, important thing I've, I've ever done as far as uh, promoting myself and getting publicity for my, for my books. Uh, you can't count on your publisher doing it at, in the beginning. So you have to do it yourself. So when uh, when you're you're doing the, the the free school visits, kind of like a comedian doing open mic night, trying to, to get those good gigs. Yeah. Um. When uh, when did you have that feeling that oh I could start charging for it? What were the signs that you'd made that transition? Um. Uh, this was a long time ago. Now we're, we're talking like twenty five years ago. Probably people started to say to me, "You're crazy to do this for free." <laughs> you know. <laughs> So and so charges X number of dollars and, and, and you're giving it away. And I think also authors would say to me, uh, look, uh, you know, it's hard for me to charge money. If you're doing it for free, you should charge money, too, so that we're all kind of on the same plane. And so I started charging, you know, a couple of hundred bucks, which isn't a lot of money for a school. And um, and little by little, I bumped it up. Um, 
So I don't remember the exact moment where I started charging, but I, I certainly did start out doing it for nothing to see if I liked it for, for no, no other reason. So what, um, how many school visits on average are you doing now? Now I do uh, between 35 and 40 days a year, which is basically once a week during the school year. So typically I'll, on Fridays, I will have a school visit. And it's, it's a nice break for me because I'll spend four days at home writing or doing whatever I do. And then one day doing something completely different. Uh, it gets you out of the house. You earn some money. You sell some books. You inspire kids. The kids inspire you. And they treat you like a big celebrity. So it, uh, it, it works on so many levels that uh, I, I, all these years later, I still enjoy doing it. I don't feel burnt out. Uh, it's, it's just a, a, a wonderful experience. So what's, uh, if, if I can get a little bit of your secret sauce on the record here, what does an ideal Dan Gutman school visit look like? How long are you there and what kind of things are you doing while you're there? Yeah, I, I'm there for the whole day. Uh, from uh, usually nine o'clock in the morning until dismissal, which is the whole day for kids anyway. <laughs> um, the, the perfect author visit, you walk up to the school and there's a sign on the front lawn or something that says, welcome Dan Gutman. And you know that they've done some preparation and they're welcoming to you. And there's posters in the hallways, you know, that the kids and the art teacher have to put together. Things that show that they've, they've prepared for you. Uh, I will typically do two or three assemblies, uh, one for grades one and two, one for grades three and four, and maybe one for grades five and six, if there is a five and six in that particular school. Uh, because each audience, um, you have to be age appropriate. I'm gonna talk about my weird school with the little kids. With the older kids, I'm gonna talk about my baseball card adventures, the genius files and flashback for my books for that are more challenging. I go into the kindergarten classes uh, because I don't want kindergarten kids at an assembly. They don't have the attention span to sit through an assembly. So I'll go into the kindergarten class and I'll read them my picture book, Rappy the Raptor. He's a rapping raptor who raps. <laughs> so it's just a skinny little picture book. Um, I have lunch with a group of kids, about 10 kids. We sit around a table, they get us a pizza, we talk. It gives me the chance to see the way they speak, with the way they dress what interests them or what doesn't interest them. We have fun. I don't have to eat in the teacher's lounge, which is really awkward and uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. It's true. I'd rather eat with the kids than with the grownups. And finally, they sell a lot of books, so you have to spend an hour or sometimes more just autographing the books. And then at the end of the day, they take me the tr to the train station and I go home. That's it. And I noticed that on your website, oh, you've got... Oh, oh, one more thing, Rob. Sure. At the end of the day, they hand you a nice big check. <laughs> that is important. <laughs> That's the best part. <laughs> you work really hard. You work really hard. Then they hand you a check at the end of the day. I assume that's a nice nice way to keep uh, income diversified and make sure that you're, you've got at least a couple of streams going. If uh, books are a little bit slow this year or school visits are a little bit slow this year, it's nice to have different uh, different, different spots. And, and there were some years when most of my income came from speaking rather than writing because I wasn't earning any royalties. Well, there you go, authors. Get out there and uh, get on your hustle. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you because you know you're, you're you're you've been doing this. I think you said 25 years, something like that. And so you're you're a pro at this. And I went to your website to to look over your your school visit um, details, and you've got uh, explicit instructions for teachers, explicit promises of of what you're going to offer. So how how often are those followed, and what's the best way to navigate? Because you know even in the few school visits I've done, I've come across some. As uh, some rather relatively unpleasant faculty and some wonderful faculty, it's it's wildly inconsistent, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, I put that on my website, and I also send them the stuff in advance uh, because some schools will be completely unprepared for you. Uh, they don't, they have never done an author visit, or they don't know how to do an author visit. And I've done it for a long time, so I really have found out what works and what doesn't work. And at the risk of of seeming to be demanding, I tell them the best way to run the day. Sometimes they listen to me and sometimes they have wonderful ideas of their own. 
And other times they just disregard what I've written. They don't look at my website and I have a lousy time. But that happens, I'd say, one out of every 20 school visits is not a good one. Uh, almost all of them are wonderful. And, and part of the thing, Rob, you might want to try this, is before I visit a school at all, I ask them a series of questions um, to see if the school and I are a good match. And I'll ask them, what will you do to prepare for the author visit? What grades will I be speaking to? How many kids will I be speaking to? Do you have the equipment that I'm going to need? Things like that. And if they don't answer my questions adequately, I'll just not visit that school. So I screen them in advance to, to eliminate the schools that probably would have been a bad experience. And is there anything explicit beyond just make sure you have the equipment, make sure you've got a plan in place? Is it, it's just that the failure to answer those questions tells you everything you need to know, or is there like a secret question um, that uh, gives you a little bit more nuance or detail? The, 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 secret question, the secret question is, what are you going to do to prepare the school for my visit, the students and the faculty for my visit? If they answer, um, um, we will... Uh, <laughs> If they answer like, uh, we will prepare for your visit, I know they're giving me a half-assed answer and they'll probably do a half-assed job on the school visit. If they give me an elaborate, we're going to do a sports day. Everybody's going to wear their sports jerseys. We're going to put up posters all over the walls. Uh, the librarian's going to read all your books and we're going to sell, sell your books and we're going to make a, a homework machine for you to autograph. And we're going to do all this and that. And um, then I know they're really going to make the effort to make a wonderful day for these kids. And it's going to be a wonderful day for, for me as well. And I assume at this point you, you have the ability to be a little bit more selective and, and, and screen for the visits that you want to do. And I also assume that if you're, you said, what, 40 to 50 a year? Uh, something five, like that. Five to 40. Okay. So I assume that even if you had 100 fantastic schools that answered all your questions perfectly, you'd still have to screen a little bit just for time, practical uh, purposes. It's because I don't want to do more than one school visit a week. Um, I find that if I do like multiple days or consecutive days, I, I often lose my voice. I don't have a big booming voice, you know, uh, and I get tired of talking about myself, you know? So, uh, I try and only do one a week. So I will very often, if a school says, we'd like you to speak to uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, I say, honestly, I'd rather, I don't visit middle schools. My books are really for a younger audience and I've done some middle schools. I don't really enjoy them as much. So I don't visit that school. Or um, I live in the New York area. I mostly visit schools in New York, Northern New Jersey, um, Connecticut and Long Island. And if somebody in, Indianapolis, for instance, invites me, I'll say, I'm really sorry, but I limit my school visits to a geographic area. So I, I just, or I will say, uh, my calendar's full now. I can't, I can't take any more visits. Contact me in January if you want to do it next year. So I will limit it um, because I don't want to, I'm getting too old to do this every day. <laughs> you know, I used to, I used to like, I'd fly to Oklahoma for instance, and and uh, on Sunday and visit schools on tu on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday and fly home on Thursday. And by the end of the day, I was just exhausted and I'd have airport and airline issues or weather issues. And I had young kids at home at the time. You don't want to be away from your family for so long. So I've uh, as the years have gone by, I have narrowed the schools I visit, the, the number of schools I visit and I try and make it a special occasion and I can really bring my A game to each school visit w without getting burned out. And does that include your Skype visits or is that a whole separate thing? Separate. Uh, the Skypes, I don't have to travel. It's the traveling that makes the school visit so difficult. The Skypes, you just do it in your home like we are today and it doesn't take up my whole day. It's much easier. Um, so so I, I don't, I don't, I do maybe... 20 a year, something like that. Skypes. Do you have a little bit of time to talk about social media and then we'll, we'll think about calling it a day? Sure. Because um, obviously 
school visits are a huge part of your your marketing strategy, but you've also got a, a bunch of Twitter followers, a bunch of folks online. So what what's your key to social media and how do you keep active on it? Yeah, um, I do it a lot. Uh, I, I, uh, I post just about every day on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Um, I have found it's been really helpful. Like if I'm doing a... Uh, a library event or a bookstore event, and I'll say, how did you know I was going to be here today? Very often people will say, I saw, I follow you on Facebook. I saw, I saw the Twitter thing you posted, and that's why I'm here today. So it's a really good marketing tool. Um, I try and use it not just to promote my books, but just to, uh, if I have something intriguing to say or something funny or uh, an observation I've made or a great movie that I saw, I'll mention that. And maybe one out of every two or one out of every three posts that I make is in reference to a, a book that's coming out or has come out, one of my books. Um, last year, I did something that, uh, that really astonished me. When the school year began, I, I posted, I said, I'll make a personalized message, a little personalized video to your students, uh, just send me your email address and the name of your school, and I'll I'll make a, a thirty second video for you. And I thought oh, I might get like a hundred responses, and I'll make a hundred videos. And that'll take up a certain amount of time. Well, I got like six hundred responses, so I had to end up making six hundred personalized oh, videos, oh, to school oh, kids, no. which took like two months to do, and. I was kicking myself for, for doing it. However, it was a brilliant marketing tool because every single one of those 600 schools took that video and showed it to all their students. And what better way could there be to reach students, you know? I haven't done that this year yet because I, I just can't spend two months making videos. But I made sort of a generic video that people could show to their students. But these kinds of things is, are, are the kinds of things that, that you have to do if you want to really market yourself. These days, and I wanted to ask you about because uh, you've got that charming video of uh, educators and, and librarians wrapping the the Rappy the Raptor book, yeah. uh, and you've got book trailers. And so, what do those those one off videos? I, I I know that sometimes it's difficult to quantify how successful marketing is, but if you had a guess, how 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 wise a use of your time is them? I personally have not found them to be as useful. Um, the book trailers, uh, which I, I didn't really have much to do with, but, uh, the publisher made them and some of the promotional videos they've made and they're on YouTube. Um, I haven't found that a lot of people have seen them. Um, and so I question, uh, how useful they've been to me. So I haven't invested so much in, in that kind of stuff. Uh, but the, the personal, the, the more personal interaction that you get, on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, I, I, I get a, I get a reaction to them and I, I know that they're effective. So, you know, not everything that you, you attempt to do to promote yourself is going to be, is going to work. Uh, some things don't work. I, one thing I have found that works well is to, is posters. Um, I will make posters, um, through, uh, there's a company called Vista, Vista print. They print all kinds of stuff. Oh, I sure print my business cards. Yeah. I, I print I print posters, and if you have autographed posters and you give them to, to librarians, they will stick it on the wall of their library so that hundreds of kids will see those posters. And I, I find that a, a good use of my uh, uh, promotional money and time. That might be one of the most brilliant tips I have ever heard in my life. No, of really? course. <laughs> yes, much more. So, like everybody makes bookmarks, but you know what? Bookmarks get hidden inside books. You, get, you pick a poster, it's on the wall for everybody to see all the time. It's your one-time cost or whatever it is to print it, and then it's there for how, who knows how many kids that reaches. That is brilliant. One other thing, Rob. Um, I'm not an artist myself, but um, when I do a school visit, part of my assembly is I draw a picture of uh, AJ from My Weird School. I draw, I draw, I copy one of Jim's pictures, and I, I make it on a big thing, you know, and I sign it and everything. And invariably, when I leave the school, they laminate it and stick it up on the wall. So that's a, that's a great thing to do, too. Well, that's that poster benefit, but without even the cost of a poster. Brilliant. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> 
and everybody thinks I can draw too. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course you're Dan Gutman. How could you not? <laughs> and with uh, with social media, because you know our uh, our our primary audience of middle grade readers presumably have some restrictions on how much social media they consume or whether they even, you know, if you're talking to a first grader, do they have a Facebook page? Uh, so who is it you're you're trying to connect with and reach out to? Is it faculty, librarians, educators? It's not so much kids. Uh, I find that uh, Instagram, uh, kids are on Instagram, okay? But they're, I don't even think they're allowed to be on Facebook until the age of 13. And it might be the same for Twitter. So I'm really trying to reach... Uh, parents and teachers and librarians more than kids on social media. I don't think I should be allowed on Twitter and I'm a grown man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what, I could talk your head off all day and I really appreciate you being so incredibly generous with your time this morning because I feel like this is an incredible writer seminar that uh, I'm going to go back and I'm going to watch several times uh, to take notes on. And I feel like anybody that's uh, been watching or listening, if for God's sake, if nothing else, they should all be buying posters. The next time you go to a, a, a school visit, you should, there shouldn't be room on the wall for another poster. <laughs> uh, but I'll, uh, I'll sum up all the questions that I'm, I'm sure that if I had thought to ask you, I would have gotten uh, even uh, more brilliant responses. And I, I just wasn't smart enough to ask. Um, so to circumvent all that, skip that, I'm just going to ask you this question and we'll call it a day. Uh, if there was one or two pieces of advice that someone could have given you if you had a time machine and you went back and you could say it to yourself 25 years ago, um, young Dan Gutman, here is something you need to know that's going to make your path so much easier. What would you tell yourself? Huh. That's a really tough question, Rob. <laughs> uh, and this isn't really something that can be transferred to other people, but I wish I had been able to uh, recognize at an earlier age what my calling was uh, because I you know, went to college. I didn't study writing. It never even occurred to me to, to, to write for kids until I was about 40. So I wish that I had been able to figure out at a younger age what I was really good at, or if I had taken an aptitude test or something, somebody had advised me at a younger age, then I would be much more advanced than I am now. <laughs> You're doing pretty good. Does that make any sense at all? Uh, you know, I, I know that Gordon Corman, when he was in junior high, he, he wrote his first book and published his first book at like the age of like 15 or something like that. And I thought like, Wow, you know, like when I was 14, I was, <laughs> what was I doing? I, don't, I had no idea what to do with my life. And it, it took me decades before I figured it out. So, you know, try everything, figure out what the things that you're not good at, the things you are good at, and try and find a way to take that thing that you're good at and you really enjoy and make it into your career. That's the advice that I would give to people. I think if I could go back and get uh, 16, 17 year old me, uh, what I'd do is I'd tell myself which Batman movies are actually going to be made, which ones are going to be good, which ones aren't going to be worth your time. And so stop reading online sites about what the next Batman movie is going to be and focus, for God's sake, on something meaningful. <laughs> <laughs> good advice. Ben, where, uh, where can esteemed audience find you online and stalk you and, and, and purchase all of your books? Yeah, well, um, Online, uh, go to my Facebook fan page. Uh, I'd love that for you to be one of my fans. You could follow me on uh, Twitter and Instagram at Dan Gutman Books. Uh, and if you wanted to email me, my, my email address is, is on my website. I don't hide it. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know a lot of people, like you, you look them up and, you, and, and they don't even put a way to contact them on their website. And I just figure like, you know, I'm not going to be that way. Um, and you can get my books in bookstores and Amazon and any other place where uh, fine literature for young people is sold. <laughs> As ever, esteemed audience, keep uh, track with the show at middlegradeninja.com. Uh, Dan, I've been asking our guests to sign us off with the extremely totally justifies the title of the show with the ninja because it's a ninja-like phrase, and that phrase is hi ya and what have you. Will you sign us off? Both of those things? Uh, just hi-ya and what have you, or whatever you like. Okay. It's your show. You ready? I am. 
hiya, and what have you. <laughs> that was perfect. 